And so the philosopher Whitehead put this very clearly, said, the mind experiences qualities which are purely offspring of the mind alone. So we, this is the virtual reality we live in. In fact, one of my lovely quotes I found recently from Isaac Newton, now we're going back 300 years, and he saw this, he said, colors are not in the physical world, they're only wavelengths and reflectances. Color is absolutely a product of our mind. And I think it's fascinating, you know, we're talking about this now, but he saw this hundreds of years ago. So what's really happening is something's going on, but we don't know what, what is out there. We actually don't. It's all just inferences. And it turns out, really, it's nothing like it. And what we have, what we're experiencing, is like a map of the world. And you've often heard this idea that the map is not the territory. In fact, they're usually totally different. If you look at a map of you know, a country or something, you see you know, green lines representing something, blue lines are certain roads, red roads are other roads. You go there and you say, well, hang, hang on, the roads aren't red. They all seem to be a sort of gray color. It's like, no, the map, the map is very different. The map is a representation. And it's like, we live inside the map that we make of the world. But what the world is like, we actually have no idea. And it's not only true that, of color and all these things, but what we think of matter doesn't actually exist. And we used to think matter was composed of atoms. That's the old Greek idea, these little tiny solid balls of matter which is, again, just an idea taken from experience. We, we see solid things, so we imagine matter is solid. And then 100, 150 years ago, we realized that atoms were composed of subatomic particles. And then a bit later, we realized it was mostly empty space. If you take the nucleus of an atom and put it, you know, as a golf ball inside this room, that's the nucleus, electrons would be spinning around outside this room so that's the amount of empty space, a golf ball in the middle, an electron spinning around outside. It's, the actual calculation is something like 99.9999999% empty space. And then what we discover is, more, in more modern times with quantum physics, that even the protons, neutrons, electrons, they don't actually exist. We think of them as particles, we call them elementary particles. They're not particles at all. Just, we don't know what they are. There's, we really don't know. All we know is that we get certain results from certain experiments, and we call them particles, but really there seems to be nothing there. Or, as I like to rephrase it, there's no thing there. That thingness is really a construct in the mind. There's no thing there. There's something's going on which gives rise to our experience. But whatever's going on is nothing like it, nothing like our experience. Matter is not made of matter, said Hans Peter Dürer recently. Matter as we know it exists only in the mind. So... Is there anything we can say about the world out there? Anything at all? And I think there's several things, and that's where I want to go with this. First is, it's not homogeneous, which means it's, it's not all the same. By which I mean, whatever my finger is, somehow is different from the air next to it. It's structured differently. Whatever, you know, whatever an electron is, is somehow different from a proton. We don't know what they are, but the structure there in the world, there's variations. So we have a world where there's a lot going on, but there's a lot of complex structure and variation. And the second thing we know about it is that this structure and variation changes over time. You know, my finger was here a moment ago, now it's over here, so the structure of the universe changed over a few seconds. It's, t it's always, always changing, unfolding. So all that we can say is there's, I think all we can say is there's a dynamic, meaning it's changing, a dynamic, structured field of being. And I use the word being because it's the most neutral word I think we can find for this. I mean, it literally means what is. Being is just is. 
It's just isness. I don't want to give it any other qualities other than just to say it is. It's a field of being of some, some form. And in a way, all we can say out there, and a number of physicists are coming to this, there is information. That's all we know is there's information. An electron is just information. It has something we call mass. It's just a number. It's a bit of information. It has something we call charge. We don't know what that really is, but it's another bit of information. It has something we call spin. Again, we call it spin. We don't know what it is. It's not actually spinning. It's just information. And that's why mathematics is really the tool of physics, because it's, it's the tool with which we can analyze, model the information, find out how the information is interacting with itself. And what happens when we perceive something is our senses respond to the information, whether it's coming in through the eyes, the ears, whatever, our senses respond to the information and then corresponding patterns of information arise in the brain. I say corresponding, you know, the information in the brain is structured very differently, but when I, when I see this room, there's a pattern of information in my visual cortex which radiates out into the rest of the brain, and that pattern of information somehow correlates with the information out there. And then that information is expressed as the forms in the mind, the shapes, the colors, whatever it is I see. So I like to say experience is an informing of consciousness, deliberately with two meanings. It's the information from there is coming into consciousness and is then being represented as the material world. So it's an informing of consciousness in terms of information, but that's where the form appears. The form appears in consciousness. So the material world, that what we call the material world, is actually just the appearance in the mind. So the second thing I want to look at, the other question, what is the biological basis of consciousness? Which brings us to the whole, this was the second question that they posed to the top 25 unanswered questions. The basic assumption is that the brain is somehow involved. And clearly the brain is involved in how, what we experience. You know, if I cut out half my visual cortex, I won't see the world the same way. Cut out other parts, parts are damaged, we don't experience it. Clearly the brain is involved in the processing of information and generating the realities that appear in consciousness. But that's a very different question from does the brain generate the capacity for experience? And a lot of people in the sort of scientific world confuse these two questions. They conflate them and think it's the same question. And that's why they say, oh, the brain must create consciousness because we damage the brain or we give you an anesthetic, the consciousness goes. So the brain must be creating consciousness. All we know is the brain affects what appears in consciousness. Whether it creates consciousness is a whole different question. And this is what's called the hard problem in philosophy or psychology. David Chalmers called it the hard problem. How does something as immaterial as consciousness, it's not itself material consciousness, how does that arise from something as unconscious as matter? It's like why we assume the brain is made of matter, brain cells which aren't conscious. How on earth does consciousness come out of that? It's like something magic is going on. We have something totally unconscious producing consciousness. And most of the scientific world is stuck in this idea of trying to explain it. Lots of different ideas, nothing works.